Welcome to the AJFF virtual lobby, an innovative uh, way that we can talk live about some of the films that you've been screening uh, during the last, last week and a half. I'm Dr. Matthew Bernstein. I'm the Goodrich C. White Professor of Film and Media at Emory University. I'm also a board member of the AJFF and uh, past co-chair of the festival. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to welcome you here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Ahed's Knee, uh, largely because it's a very difficult film, uh, maybe the most challenging film in our lineup this year. Uh, and I'm here to give you a few observations about the film, give you some background, uh, but then also to engage you in conversation and explore different aspects of the film with you. Um, so I'll be talking for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open things up for you to ask your questions. I'm going to now pass this to Amy Levin, our amazing AJFF guest programming manager, and she's going to give us some technical information about how the virtual lobby will work. Amy? Great. Yeah, thank you. All right, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you here, especially about a film that definitely needs a little bit of like teasing and pulling to figure out exactly what's going on. I know I'm very excited to ask some questions and learn about this film because some of it definitely went over my head. So I'm excited about that and glad that you could join us. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the technical components of this virtual lobby and how you can get engaged and contribute and even ask a question out loud. So that first thing that you're gonna need to do is use the raise hand button, which you'll find under the reactions tab at the bottom of your zoom window you'll be able to click on that and then we'll be able to see that you want to ask a question and then our host can unmute you, bring you up, and you can say your question or your comment out loud and join the conversation. And once you're done with that, we'll go ahead and you can you know, relax back into the audience that you can keep hearing what other people are saying. Um, but also if you're really not in the mood to say something out loud to us and get engaged vocally, we do have the chat and we will be looking at the chat. And if you have questions or comments or other things you wanna drop in there, uh, we're absolutely going to make sure that we can bring that into our conversation. Um, another thing that's technically available to you is the live transcription button. So that's at the bottom of your screen. It's a little CC button at the bottom. And what that's basically doing is it allows Zoom to create a subtitle for you of what's being said. So if you have an accessibility need and you would like to have a subtitle of what's being said right now, you can click that button, add that subtitle, and it will show up for you on your screen. Um, the next thing is a reminder that if your camera is on, we can see you, and we hope that we can. We love seeing your faces. That's one of the things that make a, makes AJFF great. Um, but also we understand that if you want to, again, turn off your camera, relax into the background, that's totally fine by us. We're just glad to have you here. Um, also, if you do want to bring something up, raise your hand, something like that, please make sure that the name that you have on the bottom of your Zoom window, so like the name that you come up as, is your actual name. We know sometimes that can get a little messy, and so if we know your name, we can call on you directly. Um, now, less technical, more, you know, disclaimer, the first thing is spoilers. We are going to have this conversation operating as if you have seen the entire film from beginning to end. If you have not, this is your warning there will be spoilers. Okay, cool, it's been said. Now, the last thing is that AJFF is a safe harbor for candid conversation and we want everyone to be heard and to voice their thoughts and opinions. We just ask that you do so respectfully. And of course, we know that you will because everyone who is involved with AJFF is wonderful and perfect and delightful. And we love having you here. Just a quiet, just a quiet little reminder um, so that we can have a beautiful and engaging conversation. Okay, that's it for me. Handing it off to Dr. Matthew Bernstein. Thank you, Amy. So uh, I'm delighted folks are here. I really wasn't sure if anyone would show up uh, after watching this film on a Saturday night at seven, uh, but I think it's an absolutely fascinating film. I'm gonna start by giving you some background on the filmmaker and some of the issues animating the film to kind of contextualize it for you. So <clears throat> Vidav Lapid uh, was born in 1975 in Tel Aviv. Uh, he studied philosophy, maybe not a surprise, at Tel Aviv University. He studied French literature in Paris, uh, and he uh, learned to be a filmmaker at the famous Sam Spiegel School in Jerusalem. Uh, he has directed a number of shorts and some documentaries, but he's best known for a couple of films. This uh, Ahed's Knee is his fifth feature film. Uh, the Kindergarten Teacher he made in 2014, 
was a hit in Khan, and it was, uh, I guess this is a compliment, remade on Netflix with Maggie Gyllenhaal in the uh, title role uh, about a teacher who goes to great lengths to protect a five-year-old who she discovers is very poetically talented. Um, in Synonyms, his most famous film in 2019, uh, he, uh, he made a film about an Israeli 20-something who decides he needs to live, leave Israel far behind, become completely French, and it's about his adventures uh, in trying to do so. Uh, this is really his most successful film. It won a major prize at the Berlin Film Festival, uh, the Golden Bear Award. And uh, tonight's film, Ahit Ni, was shown in the Cannes uh, 20, 2021 Cannes Film Festival. Um, Lapide is generally regarded as one of the most exciting newer filmmakers. He's 45, he's not young, uh, but he's, he's exciting formally and how he handles visual style. Uh, but also for the themes that he tackles in his films, which have a lot to do with a kind of ambivalent relationship of his own, his himself and his own characters to being Israeli and what it means to be Israeli uh, and the state of the country as what he sees as a failed democracy. He calls this his research into Israel's soul. Now, <clears throat> the main action of the film uh, actually is based on his experience. He was invited to this town in that desert to show a film, The Kindergarten Teacher, uh, back in 2018. Uh, he was asked to fill out a form specifying what he would talk about and what he wouldn't talk about. And this all has to do with the then Minister of Culture and Sport, Miri Regev, who um, initiated a number of uh, proposals, laws, principles, such as the Loyal Loyalty of Culture Initiative, which demanded that state-funded uh, arts organizations uh, or artists show loyalty to the Israeli state. Um, she called this freedom of funding, which meant the state was free not to support the work of Israeli dissenting artists or other organizations. It was basically an effort to punish dissent in the Israeli state. And so uh, Nidav Lapid goes to this desert village uh, to show his film at two years after this law has been passed. But at the time, uh, the culture uh, minister of, cult, of culture and sport is actually trying to strengthen the law and has a law up at the Knesset that would actually transfer all authority to disperse all funds into her office. And uh, you know she's an officer in Bibi's uh, national government. And so the whole drama about having to fill out a form about what one will talk about and one, what one won't talk about and its effects in his view of draining Israel of being, free, being a free and open democracy and actually inhibiting artists, maybe causing them to um, operate under a kind of self-censorship where they avoid difficult topics is one wellspring for the film. Um, another issue uh, that's less obvious in the film is the death of Lapid's mother. His mother, Era, was a film editor and worked on all of his films. And at the time he made this trip into the south of Israel, uh, she was dying of lung cancer. And so these scenes of him shooting uh, footage of the landscapes and then sending it to her is something he was actually doing at the time. And uh, she died, uh, you know, shortly after his visit there. Uh, and then he actually wrote the script for this film in two weeks. She died, he was there in like April, she died in June. In July, he wrote this in two weeks, whereas it usually takes at least a year to write a screenplay. So he felt a lot of urgency about this. Um, and then you have the title, Ahed's Knee, which is a reference to Ahed Tamini. Uh, if you were able to pay attention in the, in the beginning of the film, he's making maybe an experimental video about her. She's a teenage Palestinian who became media famous for uh, pushing around, cursing uh, some members of the IDAF. She had a cousin who'd been hit in the face with rubber bullets 
at close range and she was really outraged and she was arrested and so on and so forth. So uh, he's, he's taking her as part of his inspiration. What's, you know, one of the interesting things about the film is that we have that section Ahed, on Ahed's knee and his casting for it and him shooting some footage, but it doesn't really return. He references it, but mentions that he's not sure he knows what he's doing with that material. But that's another background. And of course, for him, the treatment of Palestinians in the territories, and I guess throughout Israel, is another marker of the decline of democracy in Israel that he eventually starts ranting about. In the production notes, <clears throat> they say that the character, Y, the filmmaker, is fighting two battles, one against the diminishment of democracy, hence his protest and his ranting there in the desert mountains uh, towards the end of the film, but also trying to fight the death of his mother. And they are both battles that he does not win in the sense that he collapses at the end once uh, the younger sister comes and tells him he's a good person, he should be kind, he kind of collapses in tears. And then the final images of the film are him flying back to Tel Aviv and he's shooting a video of the landscape from the plane and he says to his mother, say farewell to Israel, here's a view of it through the clouds. So the, the ending is, is quite somber, but so these three elements are feeding into the film. I wanted to talk because I'm a film historian also that he is, um, he's referencing a bunch of different films here, uh, especially in the early going. So just to begin with the title, thank you, Brad. Ahed's Knee is a riff on the famous French New Wave film by Eric Romer called Claire's Knee, Le Genou de Claire. Uh, it's about a, a middle-aged or older man who's about to get married, becomes fascinated with this teenager's knee. And if you've ever seen it, Eric Romer's films are, you know, about characters tripping themselves up morally and everything else. But if we could have the next slide, uh, spoiler, the climax is when he gets to pet this teenager's knee during a rainstorm. And as you can see, she's not very happy about it. Um, <clears throat> another film he's referencing, if we can get the next slide, uh, is our films about filmmakers who are in a state of confusion. The most famous and arguably the most accomplished of these is Federico Fellini's 1963 film, Eight and a Half, in which Marcello Mastriani portrays a filmmaker who's gone to a spa because he's creatively stopped up, but he's trying to make a film and he really doesn't know what it's about. Interestingly, next slide, please. Woody Allen made his own version of Eight and a Half called Stardust Memories, in which he's a celebrated filmmaker who goes to like an upstate New York festival of his films and he's confronted with all these fans and he's in a state of confusion and so on and so forth. The last film referenced in Ahed's Knee quite briefly, but I want to mention it, is <clears throat> the great silent film, The Passion of Joan of Arc from 1928, uh, made by Carl Theodore Dreyer, Dreyer. This is a film that's famous for being made predominantly of close-ups and it's the trial of Joan of Arc. So during the auditions, when Wise assistant comes over to one of the actors and says, where is victory? And then if we cut to the next slide, uh, she, the actor is crying and she says, in my sacrifice. Well, this is a reference to a, a scene in The Passion of Joan of Arc if we can go to the next slide, this is one of the inquisitors asking Joan about where is your victory? We have the next slide. Where is the great victory? And then the next slide, she looks at him with tears in her eyes and she says, you know, the, my martyrdom. So um, he's clearly referencing these landmarks in French cinema very briefly. And uh, you know there are other aspects of the film that can remind you of other films. So, okay, so that's the film history lesson in terms of the background of Ahed's knee. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by quoting uh, our, our discussion by quoting the reviewer in Variety, who, in reviewing Ahed's knee, uh, well, I, I should also just preface this by saying Ahed's knee 
is a film that is very hard to like or love. And I think you all experience that. It's also a film that doesn't care if it's liked or loved. And that's part of the challenge of watching it. But this quote from the Variety Critic really captures it. He called the film, uh, the astonishing assaultive Ahedzni is a reckless act of aggression, not only against creeping state mandated cultural oppression, but against viewer sensibilities and about a century of cinematic tradition, quite possibly brilliant and very definitely all but unbearable, Ahedzni is filmmaking as hostage taking. So when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about how, uh, and, and I should remind you to please, if you have questions, either raise your hand using the reaction uh, or, or put something in the chat. Um, this is a film, let's talk about what's assaultive about it. There's the verbal assault of wise condemnations of the Israeli state of the Ministry of Culture, of the minister that he's dealing with there. Um, but it's also assaulted visually. The film is not conventionally made. Most conventional films, your camera is focused on the characters. Uh, the sound matches up with the images. Uh, the editing is so straightforward as to almost be invisible. In this film, you have the camera wandering when he first meets the minister in the town and they lie on the sofa and he's asking her about her career story, uh, she actually, the, the camera actually, as she's talking, swings over to the, the, the landscape outside the window and then swings back to her face, very obtrusively. The camera is always moving all over the place and it's not motivated necessarily by character movement. So that's very confusing. Uh, some of the music is very assaultive. During the flashback of his time at the Syrian border uh, and the kind of dancing, there are only men there, but suddenly there are women there who are also dancing and rubbing their guns up against the men. There's just a lot that's like, what is going on here? This film is an example of a tradition called art cinema. Art cinema is, is our films typified by Federico Fellini or even Ingmar Bergman, where you're kind of like, what's the narrative? Uh, but also, why is the story being told in these ways? Why is this kind of camera movement being used? Why is this kind of composition being used? Why is this editing being used? And that's what also makes the film assaultive in terms of style uh, and kind of interesting to ponder. Um, <clears throat> So it's a very fierce film. Um, and a lot of what you see that's kind of confusing uh, also I think has to do with character subjectivity. Lapid is very interested in putting us in Y's head. So if we could go back to the slides for a minute. You have Y who is this arrogant jerk. I mean, he's awful, he's terrible. He arrives in the desert feeling very smug and superior to everybody else. Um, he's not really embracing the desert, the beauty of the landscape, because he believes, as he says before his screening, geography is fate. Uh, he takes this, his mother's saying, he takes that to mean Israelis are doomed because of their geography. But yet at the same time, he's shooting these lovely videos of the landscape and sending them to his mother. He's very ambivalent as a character. He's not only, well, we can talk more about him, but the scene where they're listening to um, Lovely Day, the great Bill Withers song. He's with the driver, the driver puts it on. He's like, this is great, this is in my film. They're both kind of grooving to it. And then you have this scene where the driver gets out of the van, leaving him in the van, and goes inside his house and starts dancing to the music. He does this improvisational, not very classical, classical kind of dance. We get a cutback as seen here to, he's talked about his wife is much younger than him. That's presumably his wife watching him dance. So literally it's like, oh, so he got out of the van at his house, went in and danced to the music. 
But then if we can add the next slide, after he's dancing, we cut back to Y sitting, um, looking very pleased. And that kind of cut suggests that this is him kind of imagining what is going on. Or maybe he's there in the house as well. So there's a kind of emphasis on subjectivity, his subjectivity, how he's perceiving the landscape or how he's not perceiving the landscape. So um, <clears throat> why don't we start talking about the film by talking about why. Um, and we're done with the slides for now, thank you. Um, what, what did people make of him? How would you describe him? I've already said he's abrasive, he's obnoxious, but that's not really it. I see, Lois, you have a hand up. Lois Frank, please, uh, if you would unmute yourself, thank you. I have a question before we move on. Sure, and, sure. That's okay. Could, could you explore a little bit what happened with the army unit? Who was he in the army unit? Was he the sergeant? What about the cyanide? Um, sure. You know, the sacrifice, the suicide. Sure, sure. Yes, of course, of course. Um, you know, one of the things we could talk about is why is he telling her the story, right? Why, why is that? Uh, and we should talk about that. So he's, as he tells the story, you believe he's one of the young recruits because that's what the camera's focused on, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it turns out this is all a prank, the cyanide. So we assume he's one of the recruits who, either the one who struggles to swallow the pill or the one who does it right away. But it's not clear in the film who he is. Um, if you'll recall, when they go back to the screening and his film is ending, uh, she says, I have a question for you. Uh, why didn't you stop this from going on? If you knew it was a trick, why didn't you protect these new recruits? Or actually, I think she asks him that when they're still out walking in the desert. Um, but when they get back to the screening, she says, uh, I think you weren't the recruit who knew this was a joke. You were the one who believed in it. And he said, yeah, maybe. Or maybe I was the one who engineered the whole thing. Maybe I was the commander who set up the scenario where we're all doomed. Uh, the Lebanese are gonna attack us. Let's all die. I could be the devil. So the film leaves that hanging. We know if we think about it, he's a character who tries to hide his vulnerabilities. And so he could be lying about that. But um, I would say objectively looking at it, the film does not provide us with a definitive answer. But this question of why did you participate in it? And why is he even telling her about this, right? He, he keeps saying, I'm gonna keep this short, but it goes on. It's like a 10 minute monologue with flashbacks of all of them together. Well, he's doing this, I think, to, well, let me ask you, why do you think he's doing it? Why does he does, do this? Why does he tell this story? Anyone have any thoughts? I can't see everyone on my screen. So uh, if you, you know, or put something in the chat, that would be great. Go ahead, Lois. I, I felt that was another indictment of Israel, the idea that you need to die and sacrifice yourself rather than be captured and, and divulge anything. And it was such a cruel, such a cruel um, experience. I, I, of course, in the end, I thought he was free to make this film. He was free to be totally, uh, totally, cynical and critical and angry and yet it's it's screened so um it belies the message in a sense yeah. but uh, i had a really hard time with the army scene i didn't understand the women it reminded me a little bit of remember that movie several years ago buford or beaufort or whatever the, yes beaufort. the setting seemed to yes. be there yes except, yes yeah he's Everything. so he's he's on the one hand he's building on these israeli films that criticize the idf you know, not casting the IDF as a necessary defense arm organization for the state of Israel, but as, as something with required 
uh, participation by all citizens except the Orthodox, uh, something that begins killing the soul of the Israeli citizen and the nation as a whole. So it's, it's repressive, it's militaristic. You can't think for yourself, you have to follow orders. So take the cyanide. So he's creating an elaborate analogy between his position as a military soldier and her work as a minister of culture. She too is following a system that is not allowing for choice, that's not allowing for free expression. And I think he uses that device of telling her that story, which I believe is true, no matter which role he played in when he was in that situation, but as a way of confessing to her his own role in this kind of militarization. And now she also is a cog in the wheel of the Ministry of Culture and its attempt to suppress culture. And just Lois, going back to your last point, interestingly, um, um, he did not apply to the Israeli government for initial funds to make the film. But you will notice at the opening, or maybe you noticed at the beginning, there is a credit for the Ministry of Culture and Sport. He applied to the Israeli Film Fund for completion funds, but he said he didn't want to apply to their funds to get it started, not because he was afraid they wouldn't fund it, but he didn't want people in the government to know what his film was about. Uh, Susie Wellner, we have a question from you. I'd love to hear it. Hey, um, I got unmute. Okay. Um, I got took a couple of things out of that. Um, Please. It was kind of a, the, the bunker thing with the cyanide was sort of like Scheherazade. You know, it was, and, you know, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. Uh, two, the government taking over the thoughts and actions of Israel 1936, 1937, Germany. They're, you know, taking over. Three, he was messed up in the head. He needs uh, help. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. Uh, uh, I'm not a clinician, but I would agree. Uh, we can look at uh, his rant on the mountain, which is, you know, kind of interesting. He's in the desert. He's, you know, fire and brimstone. Uh, he thinks of himself as a prophet, right? He's, to, he's telling Israelis things about themselves and their country they don't want to hear. Um, but I think that that venting that he did uh, was probably psychologically helpful to him. I mean, it's kind of crazy how we go from him breaking down crying after the younger sister says, you are good, be kind, uh, to him just getting on the, on the plane. Right, and he's kind of emotionless at that point. He's totally drained. But again, if you look at why, as this person confronting these two battles of, uh, as he does in his mind, between the de-democratization or the lessening of a free open society in Israel and the dying of his mother, he's, he's exhausted. He's defeated on, on both, both points. But I think it's also an issue for why he is criticizing himself by telling that story of his army experience. He is looking at himself as being complicit, right? What is the role of the artist in society, uh, particularly when you feel the government is trying to tell you what can be talked about and what can be explored? And Susie, you brought up Nazi Germany, but I see a parallel to what's going on in this country right now, right? Where books are being torn off the shelves of libraries. Uh, state legislatures are trying to pass laws about what can be talked about and how it can be talked about. Um, you know, we don't wanna make anyone uncomfortable when we talk about the history of racism in this country. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of impulse. It's not as far as Mimi Regev went a couple of years ago in Israel, but unchecked, it could certainly move to that point. So I think the film has a timeliness uh, and a, a universality, at least a, a relevance for us here in the United States. 
Let me see if you have other comments or questions. So I'm not, I'm not seeing any. So, oh, Amy, please. Yeah, um, I have this question. I mean, I might honestly be pulling this out of nowhere, I'm, but I distinctly in watching it, kind of in pulling out a couple of moments with why and water, Yes. This weird underwater swimming thing. The fact that the the what the woman brings him to his housing and he immediately starts like bathing it while she's there. These kinds of like weird, interesting choices of him and water. Yes. And I have kind of plumbed the depths of my own mind to be like, what could that possibly mean? Like, why is he? Why does he have this interesting relationship with water? And why are we seeing it in such like harsh ways? <laughs> in very yes. like pointed places yeah i gotta refresh myself he just kind of totally wets his hair and his face and his shirt um he takes a dive into that newly created pool of water that she says is a miracle let's not forget the film opens in a rainstorm him riding a motorcycle through rainy tel aviv to go to his work session on the ahead's knee piece so i think uh, I mean, I think there are there are the traditional associations of water with life and you know refreshing, rejuvenating everything else. You have the extreme of that opening rainstorm to the dryness of the desert. You also have uh, that bit when the driver is taking him to town, uh, talking about the peppers that have been rotted. And could we get the next slide? I see. A, a, I think I have a slide that speaks to this. Um, okay, yeah, so this is some of his ranting. Could we get the next slide? Contagious disease, okay, yes, puke Israel out of me. Uh, notice here how we get closer and closer to him as his rant goes on. I think I have another one that speaks to this water issue. Okay, so he's getting her to say what he wants her to say. Let me see, uh, no, okay, sorry. Uh, we don't need the slides, sorry. He talks about how um, in this nation, uh, like budding, plant die, budding plants die before they're allowed to bud. So the desert is not only where the filmmaker actually went to show the kindergarten teacher, it's for him a metaphor about Israel, which is so largely composed of desert. And he's creating an analogy between the geography and what he sees as the diminishing, uh, the drying up, if you will, of the Israeli soul, the Israeli nation, the Israeli people. And so I think the water piece fits into that. I mean, he dives into the water and what does he find? The skeleton of a steer's head, right? So it's an image of death underwater, even though the water itself is immersive and, um, you know, refreshing in a certain way. But, you know, his whole relationship that, that him, him diving into that body of water is interesting because he's very standoffish about the people and the landscape that's there. When he first goes for a walk in a desert, he's playing that Motown styled pop song, Be My Baby. Um, I'm forgetting the uh, singer's name, Vanessa, uh, in any case. Um, but he's really kind of staying in his own world. Uh, but this moment, like when he jumps into the water, he's appreciating it. And then again, you have those beautiful shots that he takes of the landscape for his mother. So he's at once brutal, uh, standoffish, selfish, egotistical, and at the same time, very, um, very tender and very generous when it comes to his mother. So Lapid is trying, I think, to create this ambivalent, multifaceted character. Uh, but I think what stands out in the film is how aggressive and awful he is. It's easy to forget the tenderness as it's shown in particular moments. Um, Let's see, we have a question from uh, Kenny. Uh, his frequent use of extreme close-ups of body parts throughout the film, knees, toes, fingers, torsos, yeah, right. So this is part of his 
unusual style. Obviously, it stems from Ahed's knee. Uh, we get these close-ups of the knee uh, being used as a, um, uh, a drum uh, during the opening of the, um, of the audition scene, sequence and so forth. Um, I think he's, I think these close-ups of body parts function differently in different scenes. Um, it's a kind of, just for him, a kind of artistic curiosity to frame shots on body parts. It's not fetishistic. It's not like the knee is an erotic object as it could be, well, in Claire's knee. Um, it's, he's interested in, in talking about the body and particularly the body of Israelis. I think there could be an analogy there between the bodies of the characters and the body of Israel itself, which is anatomized. Uh, but again, this is also part of how he goes against conventional composition, uh, where usually you have like what you have of me is what would be called a medium close up. You don't see body parts unless there's something happening to them right away. So I think that's, that's what it is. And certainly during his rant, we get very close to his face. We get very close to his mouth where this is all spewing out. So uh, let's see, we had, uh, is it Shlomit who had a hand up? But also Kenny, I'd be interested to hear your, your take on it. What you I thought of it. I the movie. Oh, the Shlomit, era. yes. Oh, in fact, I watched it at home and like all of us, when the movie left me, the immediate feeling was, this is the ultimate narcissism. I was very angry at him. However, the movie continued to literally haunt me. I'm also Israeli. So there is uh, the connection to the country. And I think I started to develop the feeling that what he's doing in the movie is forcing us into his totally fractured world, painful beyond words, lonely beyond words, and without any coherent explanation. Most of us have some stories of our biographies, have some coherence in how we know our lives and how we present it. There are here and there some moments of maybe some chance and that he's losing them at, as well. The connection to the country, the connection to the mother. It's not surprising that it goes to suicide because there is no sense. And I think that this experience of rawness, if no sense, he practically imposes on the viewer of the movie. Even there are references that you shared with us that are helpful to previous movies. Usually in any piece of art, the reference is contributing to the coherence, to the depth. They don't do it here. No, no, absolutely not. So uh, this, um, yeah, I just wanted to share. It's, yes. um, it's sort of pure raw feelings and yes. those feelings, God, how, painful and difficult they are. Yes, yes, you know, I agree. I'm so glad you made these points. It is a cry of pain as well as a cry of rage, of frustration, of feeling overpowered, of feeling overwhelmed. And yes, we're in his head and we're forced to be in his head. The term he has used to describe making the film was a sense of urgency. He wrote it in two weeks. Uh, he got the funding. They made it. This film did not go through maybe the usual sort of gestation that a film would go through. Uh, his mother is dead. She could give him feedback on the script. She, she's not there to do that. So it is extremely raw. And you're, you're, you know, it's interesting to make films about personal fragmentation, right? Because what is the most appropriate form for making an artwork? that is about fragmentation? Is it cubism in painting? Is it atonality in music? And so the fragmentation that we see here, and this goes back to Kenny's question about body parts, uh, is part of that overall strategy. 
what's interesting about the film is that I'd say up until his rant in the desert, <laughs> uh, the fragmentation is very striking and confusing. At a certain point, his pouring out his vitriol and his anger and his pain becomes the opposite of the first half or first two thirds of the film. It's all very clear what his ideas are. But I still think a bit of that um, fragmentation remains in, in the film. So I really appreciate all these points. I'm looking in, uh, thank you, Shlomit. I'm looking at in the chat, I see Lois has said, speak to the destruction of the knee. Sorry, yeah, I should have mentioned that before. When Ahed Tamimi was arrested, um, there was a member of the Knesset who said she should be shot in the knee. Um, and that way she'll, she won't be mobile. She'll be under house arrest for the rest of her life. So um, it, you may not remember, but during the auditions or the production scenes early in the film, he has a male actor very robotically stating what this member of the Knesset said about physically assaulting her. Uh, and this is what needs to be done. It's incredibly mis misogynistic. Uh, obviously it's, it's assaultive itself, right? This is the kind of assault of the state very specifically being voiced. Uh, so the audition sequence ends with Y uh, talking to the act actor who uh, was sort of quoting Passion of Joan of Arc. He's raising up a sledgehammer and said, and now I will smash your knee and she screams. So uh, that's what the destruction of the knee comes to. Now I'm seeing here uh, Leah and Ted Bloom in the chat saying you struggled to watch the film, started reviewing this on the committee and couldn't finish it, had to watch it since it made our festival and won such accolades in Cannes. Oh, okay. Is there a question here? Oh, glad, glad you uh, appreciate what, what we're talking about. I mean, this is a film and again, I salute the festival for showing it, even though it is not a pleasurable film. This is a film that needs to be shown. This is a point of view. I don't know, you know, I don't think any other, I, I don't know, but perhaps no other Israeli filmmaker would express the views in these harsh, assaultive ways. But this is a major filmmaker in Israel, and he's going to continue to make uh, great films. I mean, his previous film, Synonyms, is brilliantly dark and humorous. Uh, and um, I haven't seen The Kindergarten Teacher. Maybe someone here has, but- um, Like Lois oh, has her hand raised? Yeah, Lois, go ahead. Um, I thought, I tried to make, try to capture everything that was going on in one probably diagnosis. Um, it was not artistic, a psychological diagnosis. And it made me think a lot about the movie, The Pawnbroker, where, Hmm. There may have been some one epiphany in his life, which I thought was his military experience yes, yes. That, co that colored him totally and made him bitter and cynical. And at the end, and a tender person who was pained. But the line at the end, I thought, was was very telling because he was he was goading on this young bureaucrat, the librarian, to, to jump. And this, her sister comes yes. in and says, he's a good man. So it's almost as if he needed someone to acknowledge that he did have some good neshama left um, and uh, that everything else was a product. Of, I thought that he was the soldier that did not take the cyanide and exposed himself as, as um, yeah. a failure yeah. in Israel. And, and to your point, now that you bring it up, right, what Lapid, the younger sister, does, she says, you're a good person. I mean, yeah, he's incredible. Uh, the minister's saying, I'm going to jump. I'm going to kill myself. And he goes, go ahead. Why do I care, right? But when the younger sister comes up and puts her hand on his cheek and says, you are a good person, be nice, that is a very maternal gesture, right? And this is what he's losing at that time in his life is his mother. His mother is dying of cancer. So that's a really nice linkage to make. So thank you for that. Uh, Brooke Sonnenrich, right. Um, 
so you're saying, what is the target audience for Ahed Lapid? Um, people who like his films, <laughs> people who are interested in what he has to say. And, you know, you can think of many, I can think of a number of filmmakers who are incredibly obscure and frustrating, but he's kind of established his chops with his previous films. So what does this guy have to, you know, there's a curiosity about what does this guy have to say? Uh, at the same time, I think much like why in the film, he doesn't really care about the audience. You'll notice from the credits, and we touched on this, he had to go to Europe for funding. He's got funding from Germany. Most of the funding is from France. Uh, he did get completion funds from the government. And um, Brad is, uh, so that, that's who the audiences uh, would be. Um, <clears throat> and Brad uh, Pilcher has brought up a really important point uh, about funding, right? So. When a ministry of culture and sport like Israel says, we are going to deny you support. And the minister in the film is like, we will destroy you if you say these things. You're gonna be, you're gonna be done in this country, right? Almost not just we won't fund you, but we won't uh, allow your work to be shown. You know, really kind of getting to the heart of censorship. Um, <clears throat> so, the Israel system of film funding is quite different from the United States. Here, filmmaking is a capitalistic commercial enterprise. Studios and producers raise the money on their own. They find it, they get it from banks, they get it from distributors to make the films. Israel's system is much more like the European system. French films apply to the government to get funding. Uh, German films apply to the government and German TV to get funding in France too. Um, French TV channels can be major funders of films that we then see in the theaters. So it's a really big difference. You know, some filmmakers uh, complain that our rating system is a form of censorship. That's a joke, that's ridiculous. Um, but we do not, you know, what do we have in this country? It's the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. And the National Endowment for the Arts their budget is so pitiful that they can only contribute a certain amount to, you know, Ken Burns documentaries and other films. So let's see, I'm seeing a lot of other comments in the chat. So let me try to, um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to scroll here. Uh, Where are we at? Amy, can you help me? Yeah. Do we have other, were there other comments? I saw somewhere there were like 10 Looks other like comments. Caught I, all of them. Caught everyone? Everyone? Unless someone else has something that they want to throw in right now. Amy, did you have another question you want to ask? It's fine if you don't. I have some concluding remarks I can make. Yeah, I think uh, my one question about the water, I think was the, the big one that I, that was my looming. Everything else you've already tackled, at least that I had questions about. And I also watched this like four to six weeks ago as part of, you know, being on, just like reviewing films as part of thankfully getting that privilege, you know, through AJFF and then realizing that it had to sink in for that amount of time before I could actually understand a lot of what was happening. So honestly, this conversation has been very elucidating for me and all the things that I, that I missed in that process. And it was great to go back and check it again. And okay. you know, it's been very watch. helpful for me. I don't know, yeah. everyone else can, can throw in the chat if you think this was going to be helpful in dissecting I, this film for you. But. I, I hope it hasn't made the film more confusing for you. But, um, you know, generally, and I know this is not really what people are going to do here, but uh, I watched the film a week ago, and then I watched it again today, this afternoon. Uh, and you know this experience with other films. You watch a film a second time. Uh, in a lot of ways, you can appreciate what's going on more. You can discern structure, no matter how fragmentary, as Shlomi pointed out, the structure can be. Uh, but you can kind of see where it's going because the first time through you're like what the heck is going on right um so a second viewing i mean my wife and i saw um uh, 
gosh, Belfast at the Telluride Film Festival like six months ago. And we just watched it last night again with friends. And like you could so much more appreciate how Kenneth Branagh put that film together. A film you absolutely must see if you haven't seen it. You want to see Belfast. Um, <clears throat> so I, I thought I'd end uh, with a couple of comments from Lapide himself. He says, my films talk a lot about politics, but it's not easy to define them as political. They talk about people who have political opinions, but it's not clearly, this is not clearly a left-wing movie. It's not a, one an opposition party in Israel would show at their political gatherings to try and strengthen their points. <laughs> he says, I don't think the movie has a political position. I think it has an existential aesthetical position. And the use of the term existential, I think is really appropriate to given what the filmmaker why is dealing with. What is the nature of artistic creation? What, what are my responsibilities, even as a successful filmmaker in Israel to the audience and to the ideal of Israeli democracy that I believe in, but that I see being uh, desiccated, desecrated uh, by uh, various governments. Um, he, he said uh, he wanted the film to be as brutal, direct and honest and sincere. I feel it's full of rage, but also intimacy. Um, <clears throat> and he, he also points out that an important thing in his films is that the main, the main characters are no, not better than the people they criticize. And this, this goes back to our talking about wise ambivalence, but also where he stands. He's very comfortable up on the stage telling them they're all it, it, idiots and Philistines, even after uh, playing Lovely Day by Bill Withers, he comments to his driver, this is the vulgarization of Israeli culture in pop music, even though we love it. I love that song, right? Um, they, he says, there are no people that better than the people they try to criticize. They suffer from the same disease. They are violent. They are brutal. They have no patience. They can be cruel, mean, or ruthless. Everything I say, about my fellow countrymen, I say also about myself. So that's something else to keep in mind in terms of the perspectives of the film. So um, with that, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we could have this discussion. I'm glad to get your questions and help think through with you what this film is, is doing and, and trying to say. I want to remind you um, <clears throat> that we have one more of these virtual lobbies uh, coming up tomorrow. Uh, I believe it's at noon with my Emory colleague, Hazel Gold. She's going to be talking about the history of Spanish Jews as explored in the film 1618 and Zueta Island, um, which is, I'm trying to remember what the island is. What island is that? Mallorca. Mallorca, thank you. Right. So, um, you know, even if you didn't see the films, I would want to listen. I'm planning to listen in to see what Hazel has to say because this is exactly her specialty. Yeah. Um, the Island is only about an hour, so you could very even short. catch that one over breakfast. And, uh, you know, I got about halfway through it with my wife, and we were like, "We want to go to Mallorca." I mean, it looks great, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, in any case. Uh, you know, you have until, I guess, tomorrow night, midnight, there are still films to watch. There are still discussions, Q and A's uh, to, part, you know, to, to take in, uh, but also the virtual lobby tomorrow at noon. So I wanna thank you again for spending part of your Saturday night with us uh, for this really great discussion. And I look forward to seeing you at the AJFF next year. Amy, we're good. Thanks so much, everybody. It's a great conversation. I learned a lot. Thank you, Matthew Bernstein, for all of your insights. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we see you all at noon tomorrow for Hazel's wonderful conversation.